Cuba. Just saying the word conjures a cascade of images. It invokes a kind of American romanticism. Cigars, rum, pirates, poets. Yet nothing captures Cuba quite like its cuisine. Today we're featuring Danzon Cubano and their culinary creations. Before getting to the food though, take a look at this. It's called the Hemingway, a drink that strikes right at the heart of American romanticism in both name and taste. The Hemingway features the most iconic brand of Cuban rum in the world, Havana Club. Combined with Luxardo, which is a cherry liqueur, a house-made simple syrup and some lime, and finished with a brulee grapefruit and a sprig of rosemary. The Hemingway combines the crisp citrus and dusky profile you get from a balanced blend of sweetness and umami that defines Cuban cuisine. Danzon Cubano has taken over the Cuban food scene in Grand Rapids, Michigan with a nice blend of traditional Cuban dishes and unique Caribbean-inspired creations of their very own. Bold. Bold just like my guest, Larry Faragali, today's remarkable person. He's the founder, owner, and CEO of Brightly. Brightly is a company that solves massively difficult, big gnarly problems. They do software, they do apps, they do user experience, and they do digital transformation like no one else does. And if you don't know what any of those things are, stay tuned, we will explain them. Larry, our guest, is passionate, he is motivated, and he is absolutely remarkable. I just had to have him on Seared. I'm Jay Mays, and this is Seared. Amazing food, remarkable people. All right, so the first thing we do on Seared mm -hmm. is we order a cocktail. Excellent. Right. I Are like you that. in for that? Yes. yes. You know me. Yeah, I'm, I'm I, I know that. you, absolutely. I consider you actually a master of libation. <laughs> you are a cocktail creator, so I think you should choose our first cocktail. Ooh, okay. I'm gonna have to look here for a moment. Yeah, absolutely. Well, it's a sunny day and we're at a Cuban restaurant, so we should probably go for a Cuba Libre, huh? Yeah, something traditional. Yeah. All right, Cuba Libre. All right, so we ordered the Cuba Libre. Yep. Traditional, Cuban, classic, I love it. And I trust your drink choices, I think, above <laughs> anyone. Uh, we also ordered the Tostones with shrimp, yep. Creole shrimp. So that should be amazing. Yes, it should. All right, so our first question, now we're into Thank it. You. Oh, now, we're into now, it yeah, now. This is into it. Now we're into it. This is real. So the first question is, Thank I just you. refer to as the igniter. It's, okay. it's I kind of, took apart a grill and I refer to all the questions as parts of the grill. Got it. So okay. the first question is the igniter. Um, and it's, why the hell take the risk to found Brightly? It was a risk, like it's a big thing. Oh, absolutely, thing. absolutely. Like, I mean, I was, I was fortunate. I, yeah. was, I was fortunate that the thing that I wanted to do didn't quite exist and it didn't exist around here right. uh, at the time. You know, yeah. I, had, I had spent a lot of time doing design inside of development organizations, yep. you know, engineering-led organizations. And there's certainly yep. nothing wrong with that, but, you know, it, it was a struggle to find a way to, to be more design-led. Okay. Um, and again, not the, not the fault of any companies that I've worked with in the past. It's sure. just, it, it, design hadn't really moved to the forefront yet. I yeah. mean, technology in general was traditionally a kind of a black box to customers, yeah. you know, the, it was the domain of the programmer, yep. you know, it, the, the the world of design has kind of shifted from where I started many years ago. Yep. Um, I grew up in a graphic design family. I'll take a step back. I yeah, grew up sure. in a graphic design family. My my father was a print designer yep. where I, I was raised doing this like on film, right. you know, with an exacto blade, right. or, like typesetting with press on letters, letter set letters, you where know. Where design is the priority. Yeah, where it's the priority and where everything took a whole lot of time and was an incredibly manual process. I mean, right. d design at that time was a blue collar job. Yep. And, and, you know, we had our first computer in the house and, and like the earliest iteration of Photoshop because of my parents and I got to play around with that. And mm -hmm. I, I think between that and my, my love of, you know, video games and things like that, sure. I, got, I got interested in pursuing the digital side of that further. But right. there was no real mentorship or, or passing of the torch from the old guard of, of print design to right. digital. And so digital took a long time to figure it out. Right. And everybody kind of mucked their way through it over time. You sure. know, there was... The coolest thing when I started were five-minute flash intros, right? And like shockwave 
director movie cool. is. No, no, those no? Are, All right, we should drop Steve those. Jobs definitely, All right. definitely Troy, got rid of those. No <laughs> intros like that, I'm sure. <laughs> But no, like I, I mean, there there just wasn't a handoff between this yeah. is how design is done and this is how it's done on digital. Everybody sure. had to figure it out, and so you know, for as, as the technology world evolved, you know, software was the domain of subject matter experts at businesses, and it was the domain of of programmers. Mm -hmm. And you know, design was like you need to make these buttons look cool. Yeah, you know, there wasn't like a process to it. Little did all of us know that there was you know a hundred year old process in in the industrial design world of right. you know. How to how to iterate and prototype and test with people and you know yep. validate that the thing you're building is actually something anybody wants and that it's sure. effective or ergonomic or whatever you mm -hmm. know we just didn't have that right. and so it it was kind of a top down figuring it out yep. you know from this looks aesthetically pleasing this looks professional people will trust this to eventually you know designers and the design world starting to realize hey there's we can get involved earlier in the process. Yep. You know, we can look at things like business requirements. We can look at things like, you know, who's actually going to be using this and why. <laughs> right. Big right. business problems that other parts of the company are asking. Sure. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Awesome. This looks great. Thank you. So, I, I mean, there was a lot of previous expertise that you brought into this new business, into founding a company. Yep. That's made you successful, I assume. Uh, I mean, it's running a business is up and down, right? Yeah, sure. You know, there's, there's, I, I've been successful because I've been, to the degree that I've been able to surround myself with incredibly smart people. You know, I mean, the, the, when I started this company, you know, I, I don't have children, my wife worked. Right. So, it, you know, I had a little bit of a safety net. There. Sure. And, and so my risk wasn't like, you know, I, I was pulling all-nighters because I had to make sure that my kids were fed. I mean, there was a little yeah. bit of wiggle room for, I was in a good position to, to do it at the time. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we, we were fortunate to inherit and be able to bring with us some old work uh, that, that kind of was our umbilical cord in our, yeah. first, in our first year or two. Yeah. And then, you know, we just, we were really methodical about, you know, my business partner, Marianne and I were really methodical yep. about being like, who we hired, hiring slow, being yep. really intentional about adding people that were that were adding value yep. uh, to the customer. Because yep. at the end of the day, right, it's it's we want to build cool things, but yeah. we also want to be providing a lot of value. Yeah. And I've I've kind of slowly moved away over the years from just doing websites, right, right to to more web based applications sure. or or you know native software, bigger complex problems. Yeah, that businesses are still solving. Not just through their websites, but through web apps, internal apps, all these different exactly. Products. And and not because you know the technology is a tool, so sure. is the design, yeah. right? And and it's about delivering on delivering on a promise or delivering some value or gaining some efficiency or, yeah. you know, a, a lot of times the customer or prospective customer will come to us and say, you know, I need an app or yep. this is the solution sort to my problem. Assumption. Yeah, like we're, we're pretty sure. Yep. this is exactly what we need. Yeah, or it's midstream on a product that already exists, right? Like, put oh, a button yeah. right here. You know, sure. like we need this button added or this report. It's gonna be done the best button yeah. you can do. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> but it but definitely needs to be a button. But that, the the thing is, I guess the the underlying problem that we always realized, <clears throat> and I and I think the design industry in general and and now technology and kind of all businesses are starting to realize is that mm -hmm. that's, we would always start at assuming the problem or yeah. assuming the solution sure. and then and then leapfrogging to yeah. that instead of taking like several steps back and right. saying, is this the thing that we need to build and why are we actually sitting here right now? And you know, what yep. is success going to be and how yep. are we gonna measure that, right? Mm -hmm. There was just no, sure. So, so, you know, we've just been intentional over the years about taking those steps back and not just starting it, you know, there's been a period I know I'm jumping all over the place, and Please, I apologize, but th going, there's no. there's been a this period where, um, you know, when the concept of user experience design or, or interaction design or whatever first started to become popular, and, yes. and, and all of a sudden everybody was making wireframes, yep. right? And they were wireframes or, you know, like box model drawings yeah. of a web page that, you know, don't necessarily have the design stubbed in so yep. that you could kind of react to the form right. of a thing or the flow of a thing. And then there was the the maturation process of well now we need to make these clickable and interactable sure. so that you know we can have the people that might be using this thing click through it and yep. then it was like why are we starting at design we really need to back up and we need to have conversations with you know business analysts and we need to have conversations with the design folks and the technology right. folks and the subject matter experts and the business stakeholders to kind of unpack the problem a little bit like, why are we starting at design? We really need to back up and we need to have conversations with, you know, 
business analysts and we need to have conversations with the design folks and the technology right. folks and the subject matter experts and the business stakeholders to kind of unpack the problem a little bit, right. you know. And it borrows from a lot of different industries, right? You can lean into the whole manufacturing Six Sigma world and the five whys, right? Mm -hmm. Or the human-centered design concepts yep. of, of, you know, really putting the user first or the customer yeah. first or, or the internal customer at your organization first, you right. know, and what is this person going to be doing every single day with this tool or, or this website or mm -hmm. whatever it is that we're trying to do and why are they doing it, Sure, right? absolutely. And so we've, you know, we've continuously been going further and further back yeah. while looking further and further ahead. Right. So that, you know, now we can we can come into an organization, and, and this isn't just to Brightly, right? No. I mean, it's the industry in this general. This is a part to, of your process, but the yeah. industry has moved this way overall. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. To, to kind of look holistically at, like, what is a business trying to, to achieve or solve, or what efficiency are we trying to gain, or, yeah. or how are we elevating this brand or delivering more product, or whatever it is that, that you're trying to accomplish, and what does the end game for that look like? You know, the one-year, two-year, three-year vision of right. it, and what's the smallest possible bite? that we can design to and test with that'll start providing value. Right. And and so that's been a that's been the why. Yeah. I think that we got into this business is yeah. that we wanted to provide value. You know, I, not that there's anything wrong with the marketing world or right. the advertising world, but it's, sure. a, it's a blood red ocean. Yeah. There's everybody is is out there pushing product and yep. You know, nobody at the time or fewer people at the time were chasing things like, you know, building asset tracking software, custom yep. ERPs, or you know, electronic medical patient registries. I mean, they were things that were like the domain of very, very large companies and not small boutique shops that could kind of take a, a design-led approach to doing it. Is that what you consider Brightly? Is it a boutique shop at this point? I think so, yeah. and, I, and, and I always kind of, I always kind of refer to us as like a like a boutique Accenture, mm -hmm. or you know, you, you look at the the bigger shops that I tend to run against when I'm out talking to customers, Constantly. and it's like the VMLs or the Sapiens or the Accentures, yeah. and and then sometimes we end up inheriting projects from those companies, and and you know, there's this. I think there's this concept that the, the biggest companies can provide the most value because they have gigantic teams mm -hmm. and tons of specialists and everything else. But you know, my experience has been that. That's not always the case. Yeah. You know, you're not always getting the A team. Right. And we've tried to curate a little A team that mm -hmm. we can bring to bear and provide a lot of value, especially in areas that those companies aren't going after, right. you know, upper mid market manufacturing or industrial companies, mm -hmm. agriculture. You know. It's a big industry. So thank you very much. Thank you. Our tostones with shrimp. <laughs> we're gonna have to get into that. We're gonna have to get into these pretty soon. Yes. That's so, gonna be messy. <laughs> yeah, that's gonna be a little messy. <laughs> we're gonna have to eat carefully. <laughs> So let's let's wrap that in a bow. It seems to me like you really took the risk to found Brightly because there was a pivot point in the interactions between businesses mm -hmm. and how they solve their own problems, or at least how they contract out the solution to their own problems. Absolutely. And in trying to map that to the old way of yeah. the way of business that I was doing before, it, I, I wasn't going to be able to do that unless I did it for myself. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. That's a brilliant answer. Well, that is the igniter. I think you answered that <laughs> perfectly. Uh, why don't we try these? Yeah. Should we cheers first? We should. Cheers. Right, Thank cheers. you for having me. Absolutely. Thanks for being here. Did you go for the straw or did you go for the... the I went for the, the I went for the straw, so I'm I wasn't the, mopping things yeah, out of my Yeah, that's probably mustache. a good idea. Now I'm going to have to use a napkin <laughs> or something. <laughs> All right. So we have our drinks. We do. The Cuba Libre. We tried it. It was awesome. Yeah. I... I it's like, like the right mine. it's like the right mix of sweet and sour, yeah. you know? It's got that, that little mm -hmm. bit of tart to it. Yeah, it's very good. I like it. I'm gonna stick my lime in there. I don't know if that's allowed. I was trying to create a little room for my lime. Yeah. So I don't know. I, so I didn't experience any spillage there. I like the paper straws too. <laughs> I think I just spilled over here. So why don't we why don't we try the uh, tostones, the shrimp tostones? You wanna plate this? These tostones, made from twice fried plantains, were brilliantly done. The ajillo was perfectly balanced and the shrimp were cooked to just the right texture. Another starchy Caribbean staple, the plantain is, in both taste and texture, somewhere between a banana and a potato. And for some, it can be an acquired taste. While not my personal favorite dish, this dish is indicative of the textures and flavors that Danzan Cubano is going for, that true Cuban flavor. And this dish is still pretty damn good. Ooh, I like that. How messy, what would you rate this? this is, scale of 10? Scale of 1 to 10, I would give this a solid 7. Solid 7 for messiness? <laughs> Not good for guys with beards. It's a little worse. All right, let's go for this. Okay. 
I got pepper. Like, that hammered me right up front. Oh, there's some, like, burn on the back end, too. Mm-hmm. You're more of the food foodie, food critic, whatever you will. Food. Amazing. I like food. Yes, you like food. <laughs> um, what's your, what hits you right off the beat? There's a little bit of smoke in there. Mm. It's like a little bit of smoke, mm-hmm. a little bit of acid, a little bit of heat. I'm digging it. I'm digging it, too. This is good. It's still ridiculously messy to eat, though. There's no polite way it to is do messy. this on camera. <laughs> this is the best we can do. Our viewers will appreciate our honest effort, I think. Um, what we're going to do next, Larry, is we're going to just go into another question. And we can kind of keep eating or set this aside. Since you're talking, I might keep eating. Um, but we'll jump into that. Cool. Just don't chew right into the mic. Yeah, just don't. <laughs> please don't chew into the mic. Exactly. All right, so catapulting off of the first question about founding Brightly, taking that risk, mm-hmm. um, I have a question for you that I call the fuel. Okay. Um, and you actually alluded to it brilliantly in your first, uh, in your answer to the first question. Um, it's let's talk about running Brightly. Like and that's that's a, it's not just founding Brightly. It's then running it. And you talked about surrounding yourself with amazing people and how mm-hmm. that became a part of the process. But you have a team of builders that all of the time is building complex web apps, intelligent platforms, elite level creative. My question is, how do you get the best out of them every single day? Because it's not only hiring good people. No, no, it's not. It's then getting out of their way. Yeah. <laughs> right? Is it freedom? Is it's, it... it's freedom and it's blocking and tackling the stupid stuff so they don't have to do it. Yeah, right? I mean, there's, there's a tremendous amount of... I didn't realize, you know, you, you jump into starting a company thinking, I've got this figured out. I yes. know how to do it. Every other business owner I've ever met, every person I that ever did any kind any of mistakes. mentoring, yeah, just hands you a bunch of books and yeah. podcasts and articles and says, read all this and figure it out. Right. Like there's a system, there's a way to do it right. And reality is kind of really good at smacking you back down on that. There's been a lot of hard lessons over the years, but I, I think core to the core to everything is that, you know, you, you kind of have to like divest yourself of the like I'm in charge and more right. like I'm here to make sure that everybody else can do their job. Right. You know, you, you training has been really important to us. Education and continuous education has been really important to us. Yeah. We've invested a lot in getting people training, paying for school, paying yeah. for certifications. You know, we do. We've done an informal book club. Yeah. You know, throughout the history of the company, where we, you know, recommend a book. Whoever wants to read it, we, you know. We buy the book for everybody and sure. then kind of all read it in a month and come back and talk about it. Yep. There's the there's the education portion of it, what's happening out in the world. Right. And then there's the, you know, letting everybody cross train on each other's jobs has been, has been another, you know, a big deal for us. It's, you, you begin to respect what the other person is doing as a yeah. part of the process. I never wanted the company to be about me. You know, it's not like a... a the, I think it's good to great. They called it like the genius with a thousand helpers. Sure. Like that, I didn't name the company after myself. I yeah. didn't want the company to be about me. You know, I think a sustainable business has to survive without you there. You right? didn't name it Fair Golly's Awesome Kids? Or and nobody would be able to spell it. So. Yeah, yeah, that's fair. <laughs> <laughs> that's fair. <laughs> when we put the title on this video, I'm probably going to double check that like four times. <laughs> Please do. Okay. <laughs> I should have just warned him. Hello, my name is. <laughs> yeah, you need a little tag or maybe just a t shirt that says Spare Gallery. <laughs> maybe I'll open a fashion company there next. My dad does print shirts. There you go. So. You can do that. We, uh, no, it, it's, been, it's been educating folks. Yeah. It's been getting out of their way. It's yeah. been making sure that they don't have to have. They don't have to spend the time that they should be creating, yeah. you know, or thinking through a problem or meeting with a client, dealing with something administrative that I could handle or, or get right. rid of for them. I like that you call it blocking and tackling. Like, I mean, it's really what it is, right? I mean, you, you, any business, no matter how successful, is at a constant state of triage, right. you know, with all the things that are happening. I mean, it's why agile methodology exists in development and mm-hmm. lean UX and design, right? It's there is no like we gather all the information we go away for a year and build the thing we come back and it's exactly what people need that's not how business works the market changes too fast business requirements change too fast you know strategies change too fast so you need to have a nimble agile team right but not to the degree that they're also doing all the management work and they're also doing all the client communication and they're also trying to project manage everything and they're also chasing people who are paying late and you know like there's just there's so much to it Mm -hmm. that needs to be done and you really need to kind of take a step back and have somebody or some folks out there, you know, like 
up in front, making sure the road is clear for everyone else. Sure. And that's really your job as leadership, right? Yeah. You call that whatever you want. You know, I, there was that whole period of time where people were talking servant leadership, right? I, I don't know. It's it's not like being king or queen yeah. of the organization, and it's not like you know being a servant to everybody, but it's getting out in front and making sure that you're doing all the things that they keep the team free to do good work and have the space to think and be creative and innovate and interact with the customer. Uh, it's also empowering people to say no. Mm. You know, that's another thing that's that I think is, has been integral to our success. We're trained not to say no, no. often in business. I mean, like I think- yours, yours is not to do or die, but or yours is not to ask why, but to do or die, right? There's a lot of yeah. businesses that approach it like that. Well, I think I think everybody was tainted by the customer's always right. Yeah. Right? And, and moreover, that's not even how that, that saying came to be, right? Mm. The customer was always right, was talking about like whether or not a product should succeed or not. Like, mm. do people want this? Mm. But it somehow got mutated over years through the retail world and, and, to, and to like, we need to do whatever we, the customer says to placate them. Yeah. And that's actually something that drives a tremendous amount of business for us is that after years of saying yes to their customers, a lot of our clients who have big successful software platforms need to kind of do a whole design reboot because they did every time the customer asked for a feature enhancement or a button or a field or this that or the other they added it because the customer is always right mm -hmm. and after you know 10 12 13 14 20 years of doing that you know but this like frankenstein together interface that's trying to solve everybody's problem and yep. it solves nobody's problem yeah so we encourage our people to to challenge norms and to then follow up with data mm -hmm. right everything can be tested yep. there's this isn't a business of opinions as much as people think it is, yeah. and I and I think more often than not, because it's design led, right? That, that's where yeah. that thinking comes from. Like it's subjective, it's yep. artistic. It's and there is art components granted, and there is subjectivity, but there's a lot of data in what you do. Absolutely. I so I always chuckle, right? I I, I mentioned the questions earlier that we yeah. always ask clients, like you know, what is the business reason we're here? What are you going to consider success to be, and how are you going to measure that? And yeah. Almost every time that I ask that question or series of questions in a setting with a bunch of executives, that what are we going to consider success to be? I always get somebody in the room that's like, well, it has to look good. Mm -hmm. we're like, of course, it has to look good. Like, the <laughs> check, check. We're going to make <laughs> make sure it looks good, right? Yeah. But the write that one down. But the. <laughs> The, the reality is, right, is that good design in the context of applications is invisible, right? Like, it's a given that it should look good. Say that again. Uh, that, that good design in the context of web or applications or anything a human being has to interact with, the design should be invisible, right? That's a phenomenal statement. Well, it's... It, End interview right there. <laughs> Everyone needs to take that point away, I think. I think I, it's just important to understand, right, yeah. that like IT, like design is something you only notice when it's broken. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, you can look at a thing and say this looks really good, but if you're spending a significant amount of time interacting with a piece of software and worried about how it looks, then you're probably not accomplishing the task that you that you loaded it up for, your right? Your obsession's in the wrong spot. Yeah, exactly. Or your, even your instinctual reaction to that interface mm -hmm. is in the wrong spot. You go to a new city and you want to find an amazing Cuban restaurant, sure. right? So you open TripAdvisor and you start looking for it. Like at no point during that interaction does any normal human being say to themselves, you know, what a lovely gradient or look at that font, <laughs> right? Wait, wait, wait. <laughs> these, these colors are fantastic, yeah, only right? Only designers do. Yeah, you, you, you only notice the design if it's broken, right? Yeah, yeah. Like I hit this button and I don't Didn't know if work. it did anything. or I, I couldn't I, hit the button. The yeah. target was too small. Whatever. I don't understand these search results. It's yeah. too tiny for me to read, right? Yeah. Like you think about it when it's broken. So yeah. I I, I try to drill that into people too. It's like the aesthetic component of it is the easiest part. Yeah. You know, we, we explain we explain process a lot. You know, it's it's all the steps and the research and the iteration and the testing that you need to go through in order to, to produce a product that's actually a valid product that that serves its need. Yeah. I want to bring this back to the people just briefly. Yeah, so sure. your your people have submitted to this process, become a part of this process. Like earned their way into this thought process and belief? I would say that, that I hire true believers, mm. right? I mean, you know, not to make it sound all, mm. all woo, right? Yeah. But at the end of the day... There's magic to this process, though. The it, magic, I, I think the magic is actually just doing it. I yeah. think it's easy to say these yeah. are the steps in a process. And I, like I, and I see a the lot of... work is just doing it. Well, a lot of organizations will say I go through all of these steps and I think that's the, the point I was actually kind of circling my way into yeah. was that when I explain to a prospective client all the steps we need to go through in order to create a good product and they're like no 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 we don't want to do that just yeah. make it simple like Apple <laughs> you know and it's like how do you think 
simple products are made, yeah. right? Like it, you need to do these things. We're literally in this process right yeah, now. Yeah, literally, literally. <laughs> this is in, what we're doing. Yes, <laughs> the, the, this is how it happens, yes. right? It's not yeah. just like oh, make it one big button and yeah. it's fine. Yeah, yeah. So you know, that's part of the conversation I have with people when they're joining our organization, and and we tend to be real slow to hire. Mm. You know, it's a. I mean, you know that. Yes. You know what a what a what a long and involved. I worked for you. Yes. Yeah, what a <laughs> long and involved process it is. Yeah. But, but what it ends up doing is it, it gets people who do care yeah. about the end result and who are willing to do the steps. And the steps aren't always fun, mm. right? And I, that's something that's gotten lost or muddied kind of in, up, yeah. in in the in the in the world in general is that everything needs to be fun. Yeah, right? some, things, All the time. some things are a trudge. Yeah. They're a slog. And it's like sometimes you have to do the spreadsheet work and the flow chart work and the yeah. hours and hours of research work and legitimate research, not just, you know, cardboard and, and construction paper and crayons and post-it notes and yeah. everything else. It can't. All, it's not all fun, right? I mean, we have fun tools in the toolbox, but at the same time, there's there's a lot of components that need to be recognized. There's meat. Yeah. And it, and we you know we look for people and and we've been fortunate enough to find people here and all over the country that you know believe in the process and believe in following the steps and believe in in getting their hands dirty and who are all very interested in all parts of the process yeah i can i can agree with that not just because you are my guest <laughs> and i want to hear from you but because i lived it for two years i was a part of it and it's exactly what you've represented here. Like, it really is about um, involving yourself in the process, learning about the problem as a whole, making mm -hmm. sure that uh, everyone that's a part of the system has all of the information they need up front. Mm -hmm. I'm kind of approaching this from a project management perspective. But the just the notion of creation through process and ideation mm -hmm. and um, <clears throat> tracing backward and then tracing forward, I mean, I've lived it. Yeah. Yeah. The, uh, so finding the right people, is there a how to that? I mean, I think it's, I think for you, you've kind of alluded to the fact that it's been organic. Like it's, it has, it's a slow process. Well, it has been organic and it's snowballed, right? Yeah. I mean, the, the, the first best person that I found is my, my co-founder and business partner, Marion. Right? Absolutely. I, you know, I had, I had hired her at another company. Yep. You know, we, we dreamed the same dream. We believed the same stuff. And That's huge. That's rare. It, it's incredibly rare. And quite frankly, I mean, we wouldn't have achieved any of the successes that we have. You know, success is subjective. But, yeah, sure. But we wouldn't have gotten to where we are right now if I didn't have her on the other side of it, making That's sure huge. that, you know, somebody was driving it forward while I was driving conversations and, yeah. and you know, doing that blocking and tackling right where where i'm doing it externally she's doing it internally mm. and you know has been my partner in crime for educating all of these people and helping me find all of these people and building all the relationships over time to to invite people to to you know come play in the mud with us come right? play in the mud with us <laughs> yes please be a part of this process so we talked a little bit about the buy-in to the approach that you guys take I assume that people also have input into the approach that you guys take. Like you're constantly, even though there's a staple Brightly mm -hmm. process, that's evolving. Uh, always, right? And it's any, based on your people. Any good process is going to constantly be iterated yeah. on, right? I mean, if you if you feel like you already have the perfect process or, or you've become a true expert and, yeah. and mastered a thing, then that that's a pretty good signal you've stopped learning. Someone else is probably already doing it better. Yeah, exactly. I, it, there is no, we, we all are perpetual students, yeah. right? I've been doing this for 20 years and I still, you know, occasionally feel like I'm faking it, right? Yeah. It's, you, I think the more you know, the the more you know there is to know, Yeah. right? Yeah, and, and you realize how small your knowledge really is. So yeah. I think that's another important part of finding the right people is finding those folks that understand that yeah. and that can lean into that and that aren't afraid to, fail a couple times, right? I mean, I don't think all success comes from repeatedly failing, you know, and the fail sure. forward fast thing is dodgy at times because I think it, it can be used to kind of whitewash mistakes. Right, and I think if if there's success already inherent in the business, mm -hmm. if a business is succeeding when they embrace fail fast, yeah. it covers up mm -hmm. what the impact of the failures really are. Yeah, absolutely. So you need to kind of, you, it's constant and continuous honest self-reflection yeah. and a safe space for people to be able to talk about it yeah. right and to not feel judged i think one of the things that i've impressed upon and marion's impressed upon even you know interns joining our company is mm -hmm. like if somebody gives you some design direction or some development direction that you don't believe in um raise a flag you know bring it up because one of two things is going to happen right like you're going to learn something or we're going to learn something yeah you know that's that's the nature of it is 
you know, not not like perpetually question everything all the time, right? To the degree that we're all paralyzed. <laughs> Excuse me. But <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, but right, yeah. but you know, like we we should be willing to to question authority, and we question our clients, right? We shouldn't mm-hmm. just say yes to say yes. I something that was very, you know, and your people have become fantastic at that. Like that's a part of you at the company. I I, I believe so. Yeah. You know, I it's it's core to our being yeah. is the ability to say no in a in a way that we back up with data, right? Mm-hmm. Any hypothesis that you don't validate is just a guess. Let's prove this out. Yeah. yeah. So you know, a lot of times we will be challenged by the client who's like, I want to do it this way. Sometimes you're right. Sometimes and, they and, are, yeah. And you know, and and we believe strongly in another way, and and we have all the data to support it, and they still want to do it. So do both and test it. Right. I think that eliminates blind spots too. When you have multiple disciplines coming together to say, how am I going to approach this problem? Mm-hmm. And then how are we going to solve this problem? Yep. Um, you eliminate sort of this um, experience blind spot that's created as you get to know one thing really, really well. Absolutely. You know, I mean, being really deep on one thing yeah. kind of does make you blind to everything Gives else. Gives you biases, man. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, you know, there's a... You know, was it was it Robert Heinlein? Specialization mm. is for insects, mm. right? It's, <laughs> <laughs> They've mastered it. <laughs> you know, you being being really really good and narrow at, at one thing yeah. can can be a really attractive idea, sure. especially if you're constantly dealing with the cognitive whiplash of of diving through a lot of difficult things. But well, it's pitchy, right? It sounds yeah. good. Yeah, but at the same time, it's. You know, problems problems require lots of different inputs. I mean, yeah. I think that's the, that revolution in design that I talked about yeah. was people finally realizing that design had a place at the table. Sure. But design isn't and should never be the only seat at the table, right? right? It's long gone are the days where it's the hero designer goes off into a corner and you know, creates a work product and then there's a great unveiling. Ta-da! Yeah, exactly. The, <laughs> the ta-da, ta-da moment, Yeah, right? the ta-da moment isn't there anymore. Now it's, it's like gone. get everybody in the room and have the aha moment. Right? Cust- yeah, the aha, yeah, the aha versus ta-da. I, that's, a, that's an important part to, that's an important point to, I think, separate and compartmentalize. Mm-hmm. Like, I think a lot of big companies go in thinking there will be a ta-da moment. Like, we're going to give you our criteria in this box, mm-hmm. shake it around, yep. and then give us something that's amazing. Mm-hmm. It's a participatory process. That's it's a co-creative you, process. That's why the people matter. Yeah. You just wrapped it up together <laughs> in one statement. It's a participatory process. It has to be. It has to be. It has to be. I don't, I have never met a, a person in my life so smart that they could come up with a solution to the problem all by themselves every time. It'd be 100% right. right across all verticals, all I'm wrong uses, all the time. All. <laughs> it's part of the process. It is part of the process. Well, why don't we, we'll have some more of this, we'll order the next thing, mm-hmm. and then we'll jump into the next question. Perfect. Cool. So before we get to our third question, how about we try the Milonga fries? Sounds wonderful. All right, we're gonna do the fries. This says Parmesan cheese, black truffle oil, parsley with a rotating aioli. I wonder what we get. Let's find out. All how, right. is a, how is a rotating aioli different than a regular <laughs> they, aioli? They, 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 does it, does the turn just, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so the next question is called the burner. The burner. The All burner, right. right? So we did the This is like hot wings without the wings. Or hot ones without the wings. <laughs> hot ones is cool. Yeah. I, I like, like their work. All right, so this is an insight into you personally. Okay. Um, but it's how you problem solve, like literally yeah. how you burn through business problems. And you don't have to extrapolate this to Brightly's process or anything like that. Like this is more Larry gets up in the morning or someone calls Larry with a 911 or something like that. Like what's the process? And speaking, sorry, speaking of the fries. Oh, there we perfect. go. The There's the Malaga fries. fries. Thank you, sir. All right, let's try these and then, then you're going to answer that question. Good. It'll give me a minute to think of a good answer. Yeah. No double dipping. <laughs> <laughs> is that a problem I have to solve for? <laughs> yeah. Mm. Whoa. Mm. I really like those. Yeah, that's fantastic. Yeah. It's interesting. It's got a... Um, yeah. I'm trying to pick up what that is. I'm it? fascinated by this. These Malanga fries are a perfect example of the kind of cuisine that Don Zone Cubano is creating. Made from a root vegetable known as taro, these fries are an amazingly rich, creamy, and flavorful take on an American staple. I can't help but think about Cuba as not just this place in the world, but a place in our imagination. I imagine Hemingway crushing some malanga fries between chapters of Old Man and the Sea. They're delicious. All right, so 
You're burning through business problems. You're problem solving. I gotta say this, and I, maybe this will trigger something that you wanna speak about, but every time I email you, I get an email back in like 93 seconds. Like yeah. your, I think your record is probably in the low teens. <laughs> <laughs> and that includes like the transaction time going back and forth between email servers and whatnot. So part of the reason is I always have my phone in my hand. Good. Except right now. Except right now, thank you. And, uh, and I'm ignoring it vibrating in my pocket. Mm -hmm. The the other piece of that is, it, this is something actually Marion and I talk about a lot, and I talk about a lot with my wife too, is mm -hmm. if I can do something in under five minutes, I do it immediately. Ooh, I like that. And that's that's not mine, I forget sure. where I heard that no, or I've read that. Or, but I, I live and die by that, Yeah. and it it saves me from having the like accumulated tiny task to-do list later. Stressors. Yeah. Well, they get in the way, right? I mean, there, there's a, there are people that build lists. I'm just gonna crush these rise. Yeah, you, you crush them. There are people, there are people that build lists. I'm not a list builder. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm a get rid of it as fast as I possibly can person. Do um, you factor that as part of your success? I don't know. I mean, it's, it's definitely part of my sickness. You don't like talking about yourself? <laughs> I, <laughs> It's easier to talk Larry, about everybody else. You're immensely <laughs> successful. No, How please. do you do it? <laughs> That's an impossible thing to sure, live up yeah. to. Yeah. No, I, to me, it, it really is. If, if, if there's if there's something in front of me and I and I can do it quickly, then yeah. I want to get rid of it as fast as possible. And get I look that out at, of there. I look at big problems that way too, right? It's like what's the smallest amount of time that this can be that this can be accomplished. I feel like if you give yourself deadlines, like tight, mm -hmm. virtually unrealistic deadlines, mm -hmm. then you're always you know. But you don't tell everybody that, then you get to be, you know, like yeah. Scotty on Star Trek, sure. right? Like Captain, it's gonna take two hours to fix, and then you right. fix it in one, and everybody is like, "Wow, that's great!" Whoa, <laughs> yeah, that's, that's amazing. <laughs> but harness the energy of the black hole. Yeah, nobody can do that. <laughs> Seven minutes later, <laughs> check. Yeah, you. I also think that's, that's a bit of an East Coast thing too. Mm -hmm. I mean, being a, a transplant into the middle of the country and then spending a tremendous amount of time traveling west. Mm -hmm. um, Everybody's a lot more chill, mm. you know. Kind of gets chill, more yeah, chill for it's east a, to it's west. A gradient. Yeah, it's, it's a, a gradient. It's a gradient, and I came from the the furthest part of yeah. of that gradient, where mm. everything has been uh, go go go, quick quick quick, you know, high communication, yeah. high touch, do it fast, get it out of the way. And I was I was raised that way too. I mean, mm. we, you know, my dad started his own small business when I was when I was very young, mm -hmm. and you know. We would do the whole, you know, run a machine-sized print job out of the garage in our house. Right. You know, get up in the morning, do the work, go inside, eat dinner, come back out and keep working. Right. You know, and, and so it was always an imperative to do, you know, nearly impossible tasks for a couple people. You know, yeah. things that would normally be a team of people and yeah. a big machine and a right. factory, right? Uh, Let's use what you know, we have. Yeah. You just, including you just, ourselves. Yeah, you just brute force your way through it. Yeah. And so I, that's just, I mean, that's core to me. The other thing is... is for for better or worse, I I have a I have high retention of things. I have a decent memory, so mm. that that's that's been really good for work stuff. Yeah, you know, I, I can I can keep that in there. You yeah. know, it's not so great for everything else. Sure. You know, being able to remember everything all the time. Sure. Is, has many more pitfalls. It's very curse like, I think. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, but yeah, you, you, you leverage that. You well. get a lot of garbage, but yeah, yeah, no, I definitely that's been helpful for me too. Is, yeah. is just you know those. I think I think the hard Keeping work. Topics top of mind. Yeah. so you're always focused. Hard and work. You, can you know, quickly. constantly being re constantly reading, constantly being you know, tracing back where you've been. I think you you just combine those two things. I don't think an innate intelligence is something that anybody like really definitely benefits from sure. you know i think it, it, it really it's all those is about augmenting components yeah it's, it's hard work and it, it it's Smart hard and lazy work means and, nothing. no it doesn't <clears throat> some of the smartest people i know are some of the laziest people i know i mean for me it's just been like a you know brute force solution to the problem just keep working at it until you clear it off your yeah. plate and keep educating yourself as much as you possibly can and then try to retain the, the best lessons that you you walked away from it with you know? and the emphasis i think is keeping your plate clear yeah like, like that's a big component of it. Well, you need to. We you shouldn't just. You yeah. need to protect your space. Yeah, right? protect your space. And I, you know, that's something that I constantly am reminding the people around me of too, right? It's you know the. It's a hard it, lesson. It's applicable to everyone, right? Make make two lists. This is the things that only I can do, and these are the things that somebody else can do. Mm. You knock the things that only you can do off your plate and push everything else out. Yeah. And if you surround yourself with good supportive people, then there are people with complementary skill sets who will take the things that you know aren't your specialty or your forte. You just need to know that. Yeah. 
One thing that you hear occasionally is, you know, a person will say, I only work on the things that are high return yeah. um, versus low return, which is great sometimes. I, but if you have a crystal ball. If you have a crystal, yeah, exactly. So, but w what you just said about um, kind of tackling the smallest thing first that are yours, mm -hmm. that you need to tackle and getting those off your plates, like that's a path to your effectiveness, it sounds like. Yeah, for me. Even for bigger problems. Yeah, absolutely. That's kind I mean, of the critical point. Like you can problem solve big problems because you give, gave yourself space, time. Yeah. These other components. You need to protect your time. Yeah. And it goes back to the saying no thing, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, there's there's like, you know, everybody likes to harp on the power of saying yes a lot, but mm -hmm. I think there's a tremendous amount of power in saying no. Yeah, you know, absolutely. They, not everything is a four alarm fire. You know, not everything deserves the same level of attention. Yeah, And despite what people may claim. Yeah, well, and I, and I think the most intense that somebody comes at you with a problem tends to feel the most important in the moment. Oh yeah, yeah, that's for sure. And, and especially when you're talking about customers yeah. or internal coworkers, like if there's an intensity, and that's where the, the whole cognitive work. whiplash thing comes from, right? Yeah. It's like you end up thrashing between a hundred different fires a day, right? Yeah. That weren't really fires that yeah. you you could have pushed off to later, um, or you could have just triaged really fast and gotten it off your plate. Yeah. So. You know, I just try to be cognizant of that because the list, the list writing to-do list thing never really worked for me. Gotcha. Well, let's have some more fries and then yeah. we'll move on to the next question. Sounds great. Cool. All right, so question four. This one's just called The Flame. So okay. I consider this something hot in your industry, hot in your space, hot in my space, whatever, something mm -hmm. related to, to you. What I keep hearing is this phrase, digital transformation, right, <laughs> DX. Right. I keep hearing it in my circles. It's popping in in different areas mm -hmm. now. It's not just digital agencies that are saying it. <clears throat> it's a lot of different types of companies. Yep. You pitch on DX. It's not your mm -hmm. core pitch, but you pitch on DX. Yep. Explain it to these people without jargon because to me, it's a lot of, there's a lot caught up in it right now. Untangle it for us. Sure. Okay, everything in my industry has a lot of jargon. As <laughs> everything in every industry has a lot yes, of jargon. Yes, of course. We, we find fancy ways to uh, to make simple actions sound way more expensive, mm -hmm. right? You know, and way, and way more sophisticated. Convenient. Digital transformation. So one of the reasons that we started leaning into the phrase is because a lot of the folks that we were talking to were using the phrase, and and we wanted them. We wanted to find out what they meant by it. Yes. And let them know what we meant by it. Right. And it can apply to a lot of different things, right? I mean, you have CIOs that are talking about digital transformation and the way they're migrating their entire corporation to the cloud, right? Okay. You know, and, and how that's transformative to their to their business and their business process. Going from seven ERPs to one ERP, for could, example, could be digital transformation. Could be digital transformation, right? I mean, yeah. I think the the smallest, most microscopic component yeah. of embracing digital transformation in an organization is starting a digital governance. Yeah. And the, the concept of having a, a decision-making framework in your organization about how you even interface with digital and, and kind of map that back to your business strategy overall. Let's, let's, digital governance is one of those things that comes up as like the, <laughs> comes up as like, that's definitely keep being kept. Like whatever happens, yeah, of course. that's being kept for sure. <laughs> um, that probably made you pretty nervous. <laughs> So, um, <laughs> yeah. Digital governance. <laughs> digital governance, perfect. So yeah, so you mentioned digital governance and I think it's still, even that term, like we're working our, our way from term to term, that's cloudy, yep. no pun intended, but tell us about digital governance and then let's work our way back to digital transformation sure. a little bit. So I, in the simplest term, right, digital transformation can mean different things to different organizations. Sure. And I think the term, the term like user experience designer, human centered designer, whatever, can be muddy to people um, because everybody uses these phrases. I think while there are core definitions to them, they use them slightly differently. For most organizations, it's, it's really about how they're mapping technologies, tools, software, and processes to their business processes in order to gain some kind of improvement, mm -hmm. right? and how that transforms their business. So again, that can be the way that they're using hardware and, and where they're keeping their data. That can be consolidating all of the platforms they use into right. a, a single platform. It can be a singular issue that has to do with any component yeah. of the web app. It, it could be, you know what, we've... As long as it's broadly company affecting usually. We've Yeah, I mean, we've looked at our business plan for the next five years and our company, you know, mission, vision, values, our goals, and we yeah. decided that 
we're selling five products right now digitally, and and we're going to ax four of them, yep. right, and focus on one. Yep. I mean, it. It's a product decision, but it affects everything you do with how you present sure. that product and all the rest. And of that. so the governance angle of that is having like an accountability and a decision-making framework in your okay. organization for how you approach digital, right? <laughs> Is that the core as as you interact with businesses and describe digital governance? Is it really that decision making framework? Absolutely. How do, how do we get honest around that and all have the same expectations? Well, it's it's more like don't let. What are the common pitfalls, mm -hmm. right, that you see in in companies big and small? It's we're building one off tools. Each department has a budget, and they're right. building their own software. There's no standards across departments. There's no There's overlap in functionality. Overlap in functionality, redundancy. One person is making decisions, mm -hmm. and it's usually an executive or a loud person or highly compensated person. And mm -hmm. we're not, you know, it, it it's kind of like the most organizations go hard charging into making big digital decisions without aligning it to their company values okay. and and to their actual business plan and, yeah. and looking that at it in right. kind of like a holistic systemic way yeah and you know it, i i think the transformation part can be a, a tiny change i think it can be a huge change and i think the governance part is who's making those decisions and are all the right people in the room and what's our accountability framework how do we do this what are our standards right you know what are the policies that, that protect the company and meet the company's interests and the standards are the way that we implement those, right? And what are the techniques that come out of those standards? Mm -hmm. if, you, if you're going to empower people in your organization to, to be creative or to be innovative or to come forward with these things, they need to, have, they need to know what the guardrails are, right? Yeah. They need to have bounds to work within. And those mm -hmm. decisions, those bounds, have to be an agreement, a contract between everybody in the company from the top down yep. about how we approach digital. And when you, when you've put that in there, that's that's the beginning of real digital transformation, right? Mm -hmm. Because that's a lens that you can use to say this is how our company interacts with these tools and how we make sure that it aligns with our values and our mission and what we're actually trying to do in our business plan so that everybody knows how to make an intelligent decision. Right. And then the, the transformation part of that is the way the implementation happens, right? We've dug deep, we know that we need to cut a product, migrate our data, offload all of this to external vendors because why are we in this business? Why are we trying to do it? Yeah, or bring why are it we all building software in. that's already built? Exactly. So, you know, I, transformation means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. Yeah, that makes sense. Don't freak out. <laughs> We're gonna do a big old fish. Right, We're gonna hit Moscato and Taro. Oh wow. Scott, oh, Thank you very much. Thank you. That looks fantastic. Yeah, I'm interested to try this. I don't know where to start, but we're going to dig into it. A common offering in many parts of the world, the preparation and presentation of a whole fish can be off-putting to some American diners. I don't think a lot of us like eyes staring back at us. But in many cases, preparing the whole fish has a ton of advantages. Not only does it retain moisture and flavor, which are both obvious bonuses, the bones actually make it more versatile in regards to cooking, especially grilling. It just won't fall apart. Also, the cavity left over after cleaning the fish provides a nice pocket for herbs, spices, vegetables, and other ingredients. This seasons the fish from inside and out, which provides a more evenly flavored dish. The texture was perfect for me, like the flakiness was Yeah, flaky, flaky, soft on the inside, juicy on the inside, mm -hmm. pepper forward, like you said, a nice crisp on the outside of it. I like the taro. Yeah. Like we've kind of done pepper for and taro. I feel like that's been our theme. Yeah. Maybe until the the next dish, the pork. But that, yeah. I think it scares people with the with the head on the it? head on the tail on and stuff. But well, I mean, it's not like it's talking to you. Steve. Steve. I think he's gone. Man. I think he's gone. Yeah. <laughs> all right. So why don't we jump into our fifth question? Sounds good. This one. All right. <clears throat> we call it the grill. Okay. Um, this is where we grill you on a tough topic. Oof. Yeah, right. it's not going to be There's stupid. no background check, right? There's no background check, yeah. So I want to talk failure. Failure? Yeah, failure. All right. <laughs> Do you have some of that? I have a plenty, plenty. <laughs> All right. More than you have time in this episode. <laughs> <laughs> That's probably true. So I just, I mean, we can talk about this in general terms, and you can talk about how you deal with failure, mm -hmm. or, or we can talk about, about it in terms of like a specific example. I, I'm, I'm, we're flexible either way. Yeah, I, I, I want to know how you failed, Larry. <laughs> well, I, the, pretty much weekly all the way up until now, right? <laughs> Including <laughs> accepting this interview? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> My biggest failure was saying yes. 
<laughs> we talked about the power of no. Yeah. <laughs> the, the power wasn't on. You had me boozed up. <laughs> that's true. Yeah, that's true. No, I, I mean, I, it's easier to talk about broadly than, yeah. than specifics, because usually specifics involve other people. Are you still recording? Wait a Sorry, second. Yeah, so we're yes, recording. We no, please come in. Oh, so this, so, this is your failure. Yeah, so this is my failure. <laughs> um, but this is Stefan Nava, right. um, the yeah, owner we, of Downside Cabano. We have. You've met Larry previously. Um, food is fantastic. We like wanted the, to have you a little. Great. Yeah, it's been great. We want to have you a little bit on camera, uh, just because this is your restaurant. Yeah. When did you guys open? November of last year. November of last year. Yes. So it's been about five months. Six months almost. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's been fast. But we're, uh, yeah. It's been fun. Yeah, we're loving everything we've had so far. Good. Good. Yeah. Good Thank you for letting us do this. Here. Not any day. Yeah. Okay. How's the fish? It was delicious. Yeah. We, we said flaky, a little pepper yeah. forward. The taro was a good addition. Yep, yep. It's been a huge seller. So awesome. People yeah. aren't scared of the head on and stuff. No, I mean I was. You know, when we introduced the plate, I was like, hmm. Yeah. Are they gonna like it? Right. Sure. We're like, so we tried it, and it was one of the favorites. Great. It's good. fantastic. Is there like a trick to eating it where I don't make a giant mouth? <laughs> that, that's all about the uh, the experience. Yeah. <laughs> make them Just a, pick, pick it up. Pick it up and eat it. <laughs> yep, we yep. named our St Steve, actually. Steve. Oh, that's yes, awesome. So. You know, I have a friend, Steve, now. Oh, I'm sorry. Thanks, well, man. We'll redo it. <laughs> okay. Uh, but yeah, thanks for stopping by. Yeah, I really appreciate no it. Yeah. Enjoy. Food's Let's fantastic. Thanks. Thank you so much. All right. So I should have given a little warning <laughs> <laughs> that we were filming. That's okay. Uh, so yeah, failure. Failure. Well, like I said, I mean, uh, specific failures usually involve other people, so I'll keep it general. Yeah. Um, I, I alluded to it earlier. I said it earlier, mm -hmm. but you know, you jump you jump into everything being optimistic, expecting the best, and thinking you have it figured out, yeah. and then you know, kind of learning as you go how little you actually right you you actually know. So I mean, we failed. I failed on projects I've made. You know, uh, bad decisions that seemed like good decisions at the time, you know, as mm -hmm. they relate to the business and forced me into situations that, you know, changed the way I run my business. Right. I, Are, is there an applied evolution to your, I, your recovery? Absolutely. There yeah. has to be, right? Because mm -hmm. otherwise it's throw your hands up and walk away. You haven't, and ha you haven't had that moment. I haven't had that moment. I, I might just be too stubborn for that moment. <laughs> My, but I don't want to tempt fate. Might so be why we get along. <laughs> yeah, so I'll just knock on wood yeah. and say that I have been fortunate enough to not have the moment that that killed my resolve yet. Yeah, good. Which again, I think comes down to the people you surround yourself with. You know, I'm just going to keep coming back to that theme because that's a good thing. Well, it's the right theme. Yeah. You know, I mean, in order to in order to be resilient, I think a lot of that comes from your support system. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and for the people around you to be resilient, you need to be supportive. And mm -hmm. So if you try to keep that at the core, you know, where every mistake isn't, you know, the biggest catastrophe that ever happened and it all needs to be blown up and you try to keep things in perspective, you know, and you, you surround yourself with good people and you try to be supportive, then, you know, you can you can stumble and fall a few times and, you know, the universe has a little grace left over for you, right? Yeah. But, you know, it, I think the... the Further you dive into blaming yourself or blaming other people or Pitfalls. finger pointing traps, or whatever yeah. else, that 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 kills. You know that 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 makes the failure win, right? That's anguish, right? That's right. mental processes yep. on all, something that's not helpful. I think it's all the ways that we we divert ourselves from dealing with reality, yeah. right? And so I I just I I try to keep myself honest, yeah. you know, and I, I I try to do the same with the people around me, and I ask them all to do the same with me, and. Yeah. You know, hopefully at the end of it, we, uh, <laughs> you know, we, we survived the thing that came in front of us. I mean, there's not a, adversity breeds growth, right? Yeah. I mean, the, the only way to evolve is consistent pressure. Yeah. So, you know, to, to have passed the one year in business milestone felt like, you know, we achieved something. That was a big one. To pass five <laughs> felt like we achieved something. Now we're aiming at 10 and, you know, maybe maybe we'll fail out before then and maybe we'll survive that that next evolution. We'll I'm, see. I'm glad you're optimistic but still able to say maybe we, we will fail. Like, mm -hmm. that, that's a healthy realism, but it also, I think, it keeps the pressure on, like that understanding. You have to stay hungry, right? Yeah. I mean, the minute you, you rest on your laurels, is is when you've lost. It's like thinking you know everything, right? Yeah, absolutely. Sorry this, to interrupt, guys. No, oh. this is a treat. Oh, yeah, that is. We didn't expect this. House, Tell us my about ties, it. New selection. It's on drive. My ties. Let me know what you think. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Thanks, Stefan. Excellent. Thank you. Cheers. Cheers. Oh yeah, that's dangerous. That's dangerous. In the best possible way. <laughs>
<laughs> we can define that positively, I agree. That's really good. If I wasn't on camera, this would be an Instagrammable moment. <laughs> it's beautiful, it's beautiful. Well, you can still post a video on Instagram. Yeah, that's true. Like that's your reaction true. to it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, good, I'm glad we talked about failure. It's not something I like to harp on, but it's something that literally everybody's doing every single day, right? You, you, yeah. you feel it, there's anguish that surrounds it. You, you know, people don't know how to handle it all the I, time. I always chuckle a little to myself. I know, I, I've. I've met a lot of people that have had a lot of business success, and the ones that I respect the most are the ones that are willing to talk about, you know, how it wasn't just their own genius that that <laughs> that made them successful, right? You know, that that recognize the healthy amount of luck that yeah. comes with it. I mean, you can do everything right, you can work hard, you can make all the right decisions, and still things don't. It doesn't have to work out. Yeah. Right? So you know, if you. It goes back to keeping yourself honest and keeping everyone around you honest and, and just being realistic, right? I mean, we could do every single thing right for the next three years and for some odd reason something doesn't work and we just have to accept that and go home, you know? Do you feel like this is, this is something I've wondered since you first started talking about the evolution of your business. Do you feel like your business will continue to evolve? I assume the answer is yes, but how, like, how far away from your core starting point do you foresee yourself going how I mean, far away are you we're way far away. you're way you're already way far we're away. already way far away so this is going to be constant it has to be right i mean you know it's the it's the old uh, the the joke between me and marion all the time right mm -hmm. is you know i'm a leaf on the wind right i'm a leaf on the wind, <laughs> leaf on the wind. I just keep saying it over and over again. yeah I, I i love the geek reference there yeah too. of course like, oh, you got it you exactly 100 percent. It. <laughs> it you know it, it it's kind of our mantra internally right i mean yeah. it you, you can you can beat it to death with business platitudes, right? Was it you know good to great? Was it get the right people on the bus, you right. know, and then figure out where you're going? Yep. I had this idea that we were going to be a design-led organization that you know partnered with development companies and partnered mm -hmm. with product companies, and you know we would swoop in and do strategy and design and stay involved yeah. through the projects and. You know, it, I think we used to call ourselves a digital agency. I think in some places we probably still do. I struggle to define what we are, and you know, I I, I don't. I don't have enough hubris to, to call ourselves product designers and take that away from real industrial product designers and sure. real industrial designers because that is a discipline and that is a thing and you know it, that's not necessarily what we are. I mean, products are, are expansive and big and physical and right. digital and. But in that big sphere of product development, we're you know we're tinkerers, right? Yeah. Is your bubble starting to encroach? Yeah, on that is. bubble. It is. I mean, we've, we've been doing far, far less web, or the web we've been doing has has been software, or it's been, um, you know, big commerce, you know, marketplaces that are in the B two B space. Mm -hmm. We've we've been taking more and more of that internally and yeah. kind of narrowing our focus between those things, and you know, it, it has. We've even started to find focus around various industries. Mm. Um, it, it's been, you know, we've we've tended to go after the stuff that nobody else wanted. Or, or the stuff that other people just weren't chasing because, sure. you know, they... I think that's often the case. It's not that they don't want it, it's that they don't chase it. Yeah, but well... There's, sometimes they've defined themselves in a way where they might not want it, but there's a lot of companies that really don't kind of look for the new thing, the next thing. They get good at one thing, we talked about specialization yep. earlier, yep. and they look to repeat that Yeah, because it's efficient. Well, yeah, then it's process, not people, right? Then it's process, then not people. You can just clone stamp it on an assembly line, right? And yeah. do it over and over again. You so, guys have eschewed the entire assembly line motif. Like, you do things a little differently every time because... Because you have to. People process, yeah. Well, it... So there's a balance. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the the methodology is tools in a toolbox. Sure. You know, and I try to explain that to people every time. Like the UX stuff or the IA stuff, the information architecture, the user experience design, the, it's not like a, a checklist mm -hmm. where you can go, okay, I've done this, I've done this, I busted out the post-it notes, we did something with crayons, and <laughs> boom. We've Everybody got their markers. Yeah, we've UXed it, right? We figured it all out. That's... I mean that's never the case. It's it's like dumping out your toolbox every time you need to hang a picture, right? You know, <laughs> just find find a nail and a hammer, or, or yeah. if you're especially anal, then like right. a screw anchor and the yeah. screw and the drill, and you, you know, have a really big picture. Yeah, right? exactly. Our last course. Oh look what at that! Doing? Wow, that's the last shown. Thank you. Wow, that looks amazing. That does look amazing. Are you ready to dig into this? Black bean puree. Let's see some black bean rice. No, go ahead, please. 
I was gonna take the whole thing. <laughs> no, please, no, no, I didn't mean that. Uh. <laughs> Go ahead, yeah. I love the beans and rice and yep. everything on this presentation. Yeah, it looks really good. I've spilled on the table so much. I don't know what to do with it. In the in the behind the scenes director's cut yes. reel here, they're gonna just show how everybody has to clean up in between every shot yeah. of you. Dumping everything. Especially because of <laughs> Especially me. Alright. At least I'm just dumping on my lap. <laughs> So, Larry, let's try this. This is our last dish. This is the Lachon. All right. Yeah. I'm going to need a word? moment of silence. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, that is, that is excellent. This is Cuba. Lachon asado is a traditional pork dish. Roasting the suckling pig over coals or even using pork shoulder results in intensely flavorful pork. The mojo included in this dish had that perfect garlicky and citrusy tang that sets off the rich flavors of the lechon. Remember the dusky flavors I talked about? This is it. The congri, or beans and rice, were nicely done. Both textures were obviously expertly finished. This was my favorite dish, even better than those amazing malanga fries just a bit ago. So we have two more questions in which to enjoy our Mai Tais too. Mm -hmm. Let's haul those in. <clears throat> I want to talk about, so this one's called The Sear. Okay. We're seared. Amazing food, remarkable people. We nailed it on the amazing food. We, we, we fell way we, short we, on the remarkable people. <laughs> we pretty much nailed it on the remarkable people. It's a good thing I walked in, <laughs> sat down. Yeah, we really did. Thank oh, you. Um, the topic I want to talk about next is a favorite topic of mine, and it's motivation. Okay. You... We've, as we've progressed, we've alluded to some of these things already. You talked mm -hmm. about how to avoid failure, how, what your process of problem solving is, like these sorts of things, how to learn from yeah. failure. I have, I have never avoided failure. So. Yeah, well, <laughs> how do you deal with failure is probably a bit. But tell me about how you've styled and organized your life to stay motivated. Or maybe it's just passion. Maybe you just, maybe that's the easy answer. See, I, I go the other way on that. Okay. I, I, you know, again, I, I'm dipping into like, you know, business book uh, sure. platitudes, but I, I do really it. do truly believe that you can't motivate anybody, that you can only demotivate motivated people, you mm. know? I think you're wired that way. Like, I love what I do. Mm -hmm. I, I enjoy it to the degree that, you know, I read about it and I follow it and I experiment and I tinker in my own free time, you know, that I try to... I try to do things that interest me and I try to do things that I want to learn about or that I'm curious about. You know, I'm one of those like serial, pick up a new habit, try to master it and then mm -hmm. move on to the next one, you know, kind of a thing. You, mm -hmm. you talked about me and food, right? Like, yeah. I grew up in a, in a family of exceptional cooks and then surrounded myself with really good cooks for so long that I managed to hit my late 20s, early 30s without like really being able to cook at all. and. You know, certainly not well, you know, and my wife jokes when she met me, the way that I was eating was criminal, you know, it was, uh, <laughs> it was like, it was like for sustenance, right, yeah. you know, but it was just, you know, I had always been surrounded by such great cooks, I never felt the need to dig it's into it. It's just a part of your and, life. And then, you know, and then I dug into it and, you know, now I have commercial kitchen equipment and I'm doing like seven course meals, you know, it's, but yeah, I mean, I like, for me, it's like find a thing that you love or you're interested in and, and chase it until it's not fun anymore. And most of the time, no matter what it is, it's, it, it's the deeper you go, the more fun it becomes. That's you a know? good point. Yeah. Do you have, I mean, do you have associated fears with staying motivated or is it just so much a part of you that you just kind of keep going, keep going, keep going? Is there something that keeps you honest? You know, it's, it's the... I think it's just asking yourself, like, what's it all for, mm. right? The you big know, question. I mean, you, you, I'm not gonna lie. There are plenty of, there yeah. have been plenty of days in in my career that I've, I've had the like, what if I just like, did a, became a freelancer and worked yeah. on the beach, and, right? You know, like like dumped all of this. A right? traveling and, designer. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it's a, you know, carve coconuts on the beach for tourists or something. Absolutely. Right? You know, like find something totally unrelated to do. Right. Um, I, I I think everybody has that. Yeah, you know, course. there's the you have your up days and your down days. I I just try to I keep coming back to like what have I been doing this whole time and why have I been doing it? And I do it because mm. I like it, That's right? I do it I do it because I want to do it. Mm -hmm. You know, I I I think 
that there are people out there that want what we're that want what we're bringing, and mm -hmm. so far we've been right, you know. And it's just about it's a matchmaking exercise at that point, right? It's not a how do I how do I extract the maximum amount of money out of this, or you know how do I how do I build an agency that I can sell off and have my name in the history book? Sure. I mean, like those aren't the questions. 100, you're well, hundred years from now, nobody's going to remember any of this, right? Mm -hmm. So it's like, are we are we incrementally improving somebody's life a little bit? Are we having fun at what we're doing? Are we working with interesting people? Are we able to say yes to the things we want to and know the things that we don't? And, you know, so far we've been fortunate enough to do that. And there have been, you know, there are dark days that, that come with that, that come with anything. I sure. mean, life isn't fun 100% of the time, Absolutely. Right? But you've built these bonds with these people around you mm -hmm. on this mission. Yep. And you're, as much as you're, you may be a servant leader, you're also sort of captaining this, right? You're seeing them through. I, I have co-captains, but yeah. yeah sure. You know, I, I, I let everybody kind of captain their own. Yeah their Space. own piece of it, yeah. right? I mean, I never wanted to be a babysitter. Right. We're not a butts and seats, eight to five, yeah. crack a whip, where is not everybody all. all the time? You know, we've got a, a dispersed team. We've got people that we've become really proficient at working remote and coming together when we need to. Yeah. You know, we've we've kind of curated around the idea that if you if you find passionate people and, and people that want to learn all the time and mm -hmm. people that are willing to be honest with each other about mistakes without finger pointing mm -hmm. and People that, you know, when something goes wrong, they want to solve the problem instead of, you know, spend a lot of time complaining about the problem. Yeah. You know, it, it, it's just, it's, the culture itself is motivating, yeah. right? I'm inspired, Absolutely. I'm inspired by, I'm inspired by every single person that I, I have the pleasure of interacting with on a daily basis because it keeps me motivated because they're motivated, yeah. you know? If it was, you know, it's, I mean, you hear this word too often, but it's synergy, right? Yeah, it is, yeah. It is greater than a sum of its parts. I feel like there should be a hand sign for I synergy, know. right? Like synergy. Or, or like, you know how there's the sarcastices, like these little <laughs> punctuations? <laughs> Any, that would be around me all the time. <laughs> <laughs> it's like a lightning bolt or something, or something synergistic. Well, that's, I, I, I'm glad you brought other people into this when I asked you specifically about how staying motivated, because... A lot of times it's environmental. Um, it and, has to be. And, but it's intentionally environmental. Mm -hmm. Like you've created this for yourself in a particular way. Yep. And that keeps you going. Yep. Well, good. We're, we're moving to the last question. Like we've eaten all the food almost. We're going to conquer this, I think, yes. when, we're, yeah, when we're closer to done. I didn't want to do fistfuls on the camera. <laughs> I mean, we can. <laughs> <laughs> we we'll might save cut that it. for the finale. <laughs> yeah, that will be the finale. <laughs> um, the last question is the, I call it the sizzle. Okay. Right? The sear and the sizzle and I everything like it. else. I like yeah. it. Yeah. So I think of this as what's next. Mm -hmm. And that's in the context of what tech is starting to bleed into your arena that you're super interested in. Or what's next for Brightly. Or what's next for Larry. It, it, there's a lot of different contexts for this. But tell, sure. us, tell us about the tech first if you want to start there. Or ignore me and talk about something else. You know, I, I, the the what's next in tech thing yeah. is always interesting because it happens. I've seen it happen in a cyclical way. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, we were doing a lot of augmented reality work mm -hmm. like nine, eleven years ago. The right. first time it was cool. You is know? that that was before Google Glass a little? Oh bit, yeah, 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 Five years. That was Google back Glass. when it was still like an on-screen yeah. experience, sure, and there were yeah. dedicated frameworks for it. It mm -hmm. was like. Back in the day where, you know, they had magic mirrors and Lego stores, right? Yep. I mean, this was a long time ago. And okay. then advertising agencies and marketing companies kind of burned it out. And it went away for a long time. Because it wasn't good enough? Because no, it because it was a novelty. It was okay. a toy. It novelty. didn't really serve a purpose, you know? And then years later, all of a sudden, you know, mixed reality, augmented reality came back. But that this time it came back with an enterprise edge to it. It was... How do we use this to optimize factory floors or to visualize, you know, plumbing and fixtures inside of a building that we're putting up mm -hmm. or to, you know. Day-to-day -day operations. Yeah. To, when you drive down a city street, you see these things happen. Yeah. And, and that's where everybody thinks it's going next, else. right? The hood in your, in your you know, auto, uh, in sure. your automobile. But not literally. I mean, the activities around you, mm -hmm. companies building buildings, are mm -hmm. starting to be affected by these potential yeah. technologies. It, it's bleeding into everyday life, yeah. right? And, you know, we, we see AR kit now native on everybody's phone. You know, I oh, mean, yeah, it used to be it, the joke about QR codes that they, you know, they came and went so fast was because people didn't know how to use them and had to download an app. And all of a sudden, when Apple and Google made them native to the phone, sure, now they, all, of a sudden, sure. they, all of a sudden they pop back up. Yeah. You know, it's now it's, you know, machine learning and, and 
artificial intelligence. Sure. And, you know, you've on one side of the fence, you have Elon Musk screaming that, you know, if we're not careful, we're going to make the Terminator in the next year or two. And he's and, a part of a coalition that believes that we need to temper mm-hmm. some parts of AI. Like we need yeah. to approach it slowly. We're going to blow ourselves up way before then. That's true. Sure. <laughs> there's, the, there's the optimistic part of our personality. It's right at my time. I blame it on my time. <laughs> but but yeah, I understand where you're going with it. Like. These technologies, you use the word cyclical, they come, they, they make an appearance in the novelty sense or in this yep. very virgin form. Yep. They're not very applicable to yep. anything. And then they go underground for a little bit. Yep. People work on them. They mm-hmm. either, they might even get discarded at some yeah. point or they morph and evolve. And eventually somebody finds a use. The software is yep. a little faster. The hardware is a mm-hmm. little better. There's more mm-hmm. eyes that this thing needs for monitoring, whatever. Mm-hmm. And it pops back up. I like I like waiting and and seeing what becomes useful. Yeah, you know, I mean, there's there's so much innovation happening in so many different spaces, yeah. but it's you you can you can watch the industry in general and and watch how buzzwordy it gets every time something new comes into the sure. public consciousness. It was like augmented reality, then that went away, then it was IoT, then yeah. like that is now highly specialized companies on both the consumer side and the enterprise side that are leaning very hard into just that mm-hmm. and kind of mastering that. But that came with, you know, like tweeting refrigerators and toasters that are on the internet and, and things that weren't necessarily providing any value either. And that's that novelty aspect of it. You're telling me that a, a refrigerator I can tweet from doesn't have value for my life? I don't know. Maybe, <laughs> maybe it, that might be your thing, right? <laughs> Truly not. <laughs> Truly not whatsoever. You know, I, I've, I've played around just because I'm a gadget guy. I've yeah. played around with things like, you know, having an IoT-enabled lock for your oh, for your front door, right? We, and then we've I've, talked about our home automation yeah. systems, everything from the Nest to the Hue lights, all those yeah. different components, smart locks. And then, I've, and then I've run into the situation where the battery died and I couldn't open my front door. I had to enter through a different door. I could have predicted that. I know, right? Like, let's take, let's take overly complicated things and... And apply them to simple everyday tasks. You know, I still, I still struggle with you know not just going to the regular whiteboard and you yeah, know, oh yeah, and and the regular old post-it notes and not the fancy electronic ones. But you know, the, there's the there's the then it was blockchain, right? Yep. And then everybody, everything had to be crypto or on the blockchain. Bursty, Bursty has since gone under, under underground, I should say, yeah. not gone under. Like, well, people failed, are, but, yeah, I mean, but I think people are still mulling over blockchain. At least in my yeah. circles, like they're, it's kind of like AR was maybe mm-hmm. six, seven years ago at this yep. point. Like, oh, we got to be able to do something with this mm-hmm. beyond a currency. Yeah, so I, I think you know we're gonna apply that sizzle to brightly and and be a crypto IoT. I knew it. Blockchain. What's next? Artificial intelligence. That's the sizzle reel. That's yeah. what I'm talking about. <laughs> so that's a little bit about the technology. Do sure. you have, I mean, I know it's a little hard to predict, but, but just give me a sense of, based on some of the clients you're landing now and what you know about the conversations you're mm-hmm. having, do you, do you know where you're going at, at this point? Three months, six months, nine months. You don't have to tell me what it is. I don't want to tell your competitors everything you're doing, but... No, we're not competing. I mean, we're really actually. Not. Yeah. I, I don't. I don't feel like we're. I'm gonna we're eat out a there piece competing. of humble pie there. I think yeah. that's a good way of. Um, it's a big at world. It. There's a lot of work for everybody to yeah. do, and I think like it goes back to the matchmaking thing, yeah. right? There's a good fit. There's a right fit for yeah. what each organization is trying to do. Um, I kind of poo-poo the whole competition thing because I mean, there's there's interesting things happening all over this industry, all over this world. Yeah. And, you know, we try to learn from other people and what they're doing, and we try to carve out our own little niche there. We've been leaning heavily into, you know, getting involved in businesses uh, from a product standpoint. Okay. You know, build, building up our portfolio of things that we're invested in that we can make a meaningful impact on, you know, that we can bring services to, uh, just to, you know, We've spent so much time, you know, working on helping other people wrench on their businesses, you know, and, yes. and and tinker and improve that, you know, you get hungry to do some of that yourself, but you don't want to stop doing the consulting side right. either because that's where you get exposed to a whole lot of things that you wouldn't have otherwise, you know, thought of or known about. Extrapolate on that fact a little bit because I think that's underappreciated in this industry. Like, you need to stay involved mm-hmm. in new questions to evolve. Like yeah, the, that's the danger of templating, right? Is that you often stop asking. Well, and you don't know what you don't know. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You know, and and <clears throat> so you know, I mean, there's some percentage of our business, or at least me personally, and and you know, my tightly aligned partners, and and you know, the the people who are around me right now that are mm-hmm. all curious, you know, and and 
learning constantly new industries you know whatever it may be you know we've done agriculture education you know insurance mm -hmm. um, manufacturing industrial across many different areas and and you know, you, I think if you approach that with curiosity, you get to learn a whole bunch of stuff that you would never have known about otherwise. I mean, right. I've learned about forklifts and office chairs and medical <laughs> devices and mm -hmm. industries I, I had. That's the thing I love about this industry is I, I would have no ability to touch those businesses uh, if I wasn't doing what I do, you know? and I love that. It, it implies a multiple disciplinary po approach to everything. Mm -hmm. I'm going to... Definitely probably say that again. <laughs> I love that. Just it five times fast. Yeah. <laughs> it implies, okay, so in the case of what you just said, it's multidisciplinary, right? Yep. You get to go into these different businesses. You get mm -hmm. to bring your expertise. They bring their expertise mm -hmm. into it. Um, and you get to work with companies that are, they themselves don't know the next problem they're going to have to tackle. Yep. So you're discovering part of that with them. Yep. So that's, I mean, that's kind of driving where we go. Yeah. You know, I... It, we're like a, you know, I mean, again, if you're in this industry, you're a perpetually curious person, I think, and and you have to be because technology changes constantly. Yeah. To your first question, right? Yeah. Methodology changes constantly. Yep. Businesses change constantly. Business problems there's, there's change just, constantly. Yeah, you're just endlessly. It's it's being a student all the time, right? So I think to answer your your holistic question, right? Yeah. There's the projects and products that we want to carve out or become a part of, yep. you know, that, that represents one wing of our future. And yeah. there's the perpetual curiosity that has a stick in our nose in other people's business. It yeah. needs to be a part of it, literally. Yeah. It has to con be constant. Even if you went f as full product as you could, you wouldn't give up this part of it. I, I mean, even if it was just me, yeah. I would still need to go you stick my nose in other people's business. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> I need to learn about what you're doing. Yeah. <laughs> it's a good no, way. It's a good way it's to be. It's a good way to be. It is a good way to be. Well, I mean, what'd you think? Don San Cubano? Fantastic food. I will definitely be here again. Amazing. Loved it. I will I, definitely drink more of these, I'll but drink not more on these camera. Too. Yeah, not on camera. <laughs> We're going to a few more off camera for sure. Um, thank you again for doing this. Thank you for having me. Um, it's been a true joy to have gotten to know you as a friend, as a, a, a person I hired to do some business for me, as a person who hired me. Like that's literally, it's been a good, it's been a joy in my life. So thank you very much for that. Well, thank you for uh, having me. Thank you for being part of my life, <laughs> yeah, right? Absolutely. Um, this is the inaugural episode. You're going to be the first. You will always hold that special place in our hearts, <laughs> but you have to promise to come back at some point in the future. I, season five in the finale. <laughs> like way in I'm the gonna, future. <laughs> jump out of the shadows. <laughs> yeah, there it is. Surprise. Well, again, thank you very much uh, for joining us on Seared Amazing Food. You are a remarkable person. Oh, so thank are you. you. Thank Take you. care. Yep. Yeah, we'll rearrange. Hence the notes cards. <laughs> this, is agile. this is agile methodology. This is agile, this is agile filmmaking at its best. <laughs> I might take that.